In this segment, I want to talk about Richard Nixon. Nixon, I have here as the, the third of the presidential candidates, major candidates running in the 1968 election. Nixon's not third because he's the least important by any means, and I wouldn't want to give you that impression, but Nixon's third in no small part because he, he, his shadow, let's put it that way, his shadow cast across the 20th century is extraordinarily long. From World War II all the way through the end of his presidency and really beyond, there's the presence of Richard Nixon uh, in and behind American politics. And I think that's something uh, really worth considering as we talk about Richard Nixon. So Nixon runs as the Republican candidate in 1968 against the Democrat Hubert Humphrey and the Independent George Wallace. As far as background goes, Nixon um, comes from California, He's coming from the West Coast, and he grew up with a very devoted mother who apparently thought extraordinarily highly of her son and a Quaker mother. In other words, his mother was also a Quaker. And I'm not sure entirely what effect that had on Nixon. I've read differing accounts, but I dare say it, it helped both the fact he had a sort of doting mother and that he comes from this Quaker background. It probably helped in fundamental ways to define his character, his personality, who he was when you kind of move aside the political facade. He served in the Second World War um, out in the Pacific, if I remember correctly. And I remember a story about Nixon's service, and that was that he was a poker player. But he didn't play for fun. He played to win. Uh, if he didn't have the hand that he thought would win the game, um, Richard Nixon would fold and wait until he found a, a really good hand knowing that he would win. It wasn't the bluffing. It, it wasn't the, uh, the skill of judging personality. It was nothing like that. It was a sort of intense desire um, for success. Not winning for its own sake, but success in terms of accumulating capital. Now, what I'm focused on with that statement is I think we already are learning something about Richard Nixon. Um, and I don't know the, any better way to put it than he's, he's not a fun guy. When you get beyond the politics and to the, the, the man there, he's just not a fun guy. He's intense. He can be extraordinarily disciplined, rigid even, I think, at times. But he's always focused always focused, and he's a fighter. We're going to find that out. It turns out that Nixon apparently used some of his poker winnings from the Second World War to help fund his first political race, and he's already into, uh, into politics by 1946. He goes on, of course, to Congress, and in, 19, in the 1940s and 1950s, he develops a reputation as a very strong, uh, I was almost going to say virulent, but very strong anti-communist. 1953, uh, he becomes vice president under Dwight Eisenhower, and then, of course, in 1960, when he runs for the presidency himself, um, Richard Nixon is defeated by John F. Kennedy by an extraordinarily slim margin. It was quite possible for Richard Nixon to um, have contested the 1960 election. And I think it's notable that he chose not to. Instead, he goes back uh, to California and seeks to become the governor of California in 1962. And the campaign is a failure. And here again, we have a chance, I think, to see something about the Nixon personality. He was always at odds with, with Dwight Eisenhower. They didn't get on well. I don't think Eisenhower trusted Richard Nixon. He saw him as perhaps too ambitious, but also I think Nixon's own personality, a bit of paranoia, a sense of insecurity, a lack of confidence, if you will, um, 
probably put Eisenhower off a good bit. After the 1962 gubernatorial campaign, Nixon strikes out at the media. He makes that kind of woeful statement that um, he's, you know, I'll paraphrase some of it, but basically he's, he's, he hopes that the media is happy now that Nixon's been beaten, that they were on the opposition side. And, and he says that, you know, um, you won't have Nixon to kick around anymore. Most political observers pretty much forgot about Nixon in a, in a sense. Um, as a, as, a, as a potential candidate for high office, high national office. He didn't go away. He did sort of disappear from the national radar a bit. Uh, he practiced law. And he actually started, by about 1966, he started really fostering relationships. He would go out and sort of partly on his own dime, certainly with his own time, he would go out and campaign for other Republican candidates, building um, numerous, numerous obligations throughout the Republican Party so that these folks who won their elections, and they won in part because Nixon had helped them campaign, they owed him. And you get a sense that Nixon, the ambitious politician, post-1962 hadn't simply drifted away, but in fact, was already planning, had already planned, perhaps is a better way to put it, for his reemergence on the national scene. It's in 1968, at a sort of opportune moment, that Richard Nixon reemerges as a presidential candidate for the Republican Party. Essentially, Nixon will run on many of the same issues that George Wallace will utilize. Nixon had come to see, had come to believe, that most Americans, certainly middle class Americans, had had enough of hearing about the problems of the other America. Um, that they had, or at least had a sense that they had already sacrificed in some ways for uh, racial justice, that they were tired of this campaigning for reform that seemed to benefit an undeserving class. Nixon also saw and, and, and drew upon the backlash to federal government that many Americans had come to believe lay behind many of the problems that the United States now faced. That, that big government, i.e. Lyndon Johnson's great society programs, etc., simply had fostered not an improvement in the United States, but in fact um, a loss, in particular a loss of, of certain values that the middle class held as truly representative of the United States. So Richard Nixon is appealing to what he considers to be, and the term that's often used is the silent majority. In other words, he's trying to appeal to the American, kind of middle class American that's going to work every day, trying to pay off a house, trying to pay off a car. They're not out in the streets protesting. They're not out in the streets rioting. They're not demanding their rights. At least that's kind of how Nixon would put it. They are respectable. Nixon is also going to play to uh, questions about Vietnam. Although he's not terribly specific during the campaign, Nixon promises to end the war in Vietnam with honor. In other words, we're going to get the U.S. out of this quagmire. We're going to get the U.S. out of this drain, but we're going to do it in a way that will not tarnish the reputation 
of the United States worldwide. So if you really wanted to boil it down, for now, think about the silent majority as the focus of the appeal. Think about a promise of law and order, i.e. basic government, good government. And then in the war in Vietnam with honor. And those become the, the kind of essential pieces, perhaps, um, of the Nixon campaign. Where all this comes down at the, at the very end of it, the 1968 campaign, just to give you some idea, the Democrats are split. Um, they were already split before the campaign and they never managed to truly unify during the campaign. George Wallace really doesn't hurt the Democrats in some ways because the conservatives are already fleeing the Democratic Party so much as he pulls potential votes from Richard Nixon, especially among blue collar workers. Nixon wins. And here are the statistics. His victory in 1968 is by a margin that's almost as small as the margin of defeat he suffered in 1960. Nixon wins 43.4% of the popular vote. Hubert Humphrey manages a comeback and ends up winning 42.7% of the popular vote. And George Wallace, the independent candidate, takes home 13.5% of the popular vote. In the electoral college terms, Hubert Humphrey takes Washington, Minnesota, Texas, and all 14 states. Nixon will take the West and the Midwest. But here's the interesting thing. And it's something I want to talk about in the next segment. Nixon also takes Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Florida. And what you have there is not merely sort of the West, like California, where Nixon's from, not merely the Midwest, kind of middle America, but you also have Nixon taking states in the upper South and a few deep South or lower South states. George Wallace in the Electoral College, and remember that's done by state, so we actually have in this country 50 different state elections for president. George Wallace takes Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. Most of those are deep South states. So the South, the old Democratic conservative South has gone for Wallace and portions of the Upper South and Lower South then have gone for Nixon, the Republican. Wallace is an independent. That gives you a, a sense of a couple of things. One, what's happened to the Democratic Party. And what's happened to the Democratic Party is it's, it's fractured and it's split. Southern conservatives, traditionally Democrats, are no longer loyal necessarily to the Democratic Party. Many Southern senators and representatives have begun switching over to the Republican Party by 1968. What we're seeing in the 1968 election is a realignment. A realignment of American politics. And again, it doesn't just happen in 68. It starts before and it comes after. But it reflects the emergence the emergence of a new conservative theme in American politics and in American society that manifests itself regionally in different regional political alignments. If you look at the record today, the American South tends to vote Republican. Tends to vote Republican. Not all parts of the South. Not all states all the time, 
but it's extraordinarily different politically than the early 20th century when the solid democratic South could be depended upon to provide a minority control for Southerners in the Democratic Party. I'm going to pick up in the next segment talking about some of the reasons for this realignment. And then we'll move on to examine the Nixon presidency and ultimately uh, we'll make it to Watergate.